did the preacher. But again, I'd like to say thank you all for making time to come tonight and join us in this meeting. Um, I am Becky Johnson, and I guess um, I started with this back about 2011. Uh, there's some guys in here, and you'll probably get a chance to meet them. We came together and we decided to form the Granger United Anti-Drug Coalition. And since then, um, this has been on my heart to try to help people any way that I can. And there was an epidemic in 2011 when my kids was in high school. And you know what? There's still a, an epidemic in 2017. And I say here all the time, if, if you've not been touched by drug or alcohol addiction, then you're very blessed because sooner or later it's going to touch you. And when it does, it hurts. Um, and I'd like to, to let you know that we, we have some speakers here tonight, and we'll try to go pretty quick, but still yet, I want you to get the meat of this message. And uh, we've got some panelists that'll be talking to you and, and actually telling you some things that's going on in the county that you may not even realize. And, and I've got some people here that's gonna give you some real good information of how to find help when, when that relative, when that son or that daughter or that niece or nephew or, or mom or dad comes to you and says, hey, I've had enough. I'm ready for help. But first of all, I have met a dear friend. Um, God leads you down some really unique pathways and, and I retired and I didn't like it and I went back to work. And so I started teaching again and I'm doing adult education. And um, through, through that journey, I have met a very good friend and her name is Amy Kidwell. And uh, when Amy came in my class, I just could not imagine what this young soccer mom was coming back to, cl to, to my class. It just blew my mind. And she was so good in these studies and everything. I just, I, I couldn't, you know, I just couldn't understand. And then Amy told me her story. And tonight I'm gonna let this meeting start with Amy's story. So Amy, if you'll come on up here And she's real nervous, and this is probably one of her first times ever talking out. So y'all say a little prior, because Amy sure does appreciate those priors. Yeah, please. Um, I'm Amy, and uh, my addiction started when I had my second daughter. And um, I was a good mom until I had baby number two. And I became somebody that I didn't know. I was afraid of everything and everyone. I thought I was sick all the time. Um, my own children made me afraid. I, um, my doctor decided that he would uh, give me Xanax to knock off the uh, edge so I could be a mother. The only thing was one was good and half a bottle was great because I could go to work and I could raise my children until I couldn't raise my children anymore. And um, I went to jail, but way after, many years later, um, everybody thought I was recovered. My whole family thought I was recovered. And um, I hid it well until I couldn't hide it anymore. I went to jail here in Granger County, and I went to jail in Hamlin County. And um, God held my hand when, when uh, the bottom fell out from under everything that I had cloaked around me as a lie, he held my hand because it was time to um, sober up. And he sobered me up without me killing anybody. So by the grace of God, I didn't kill him. I was on the road, but I didn't kill myself and I didn't kill them. I didn't have to go meet my maker like that. And um, I didn't, I, I went to rehab and uh, I did my two month program and I went to meetings, but because I lost my license, I didn't really ask my mom and dad to take me to any meetings. Um, but the Lord came in and he held my hand. Mm -hmm. And if you know anybody that has an addiction problem, even if they can't admit it to you, they need you to hold their hand. Mm -hmm. Because we're lonely and we're broken. And we were probably broken before we started using drugs. Yeah. We just used drugs so that we could not feel broken anymore. And God holds my hand. Amen. And now, um, February the 14th, I will be sober two years. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
but you still have moments that you, it'll slink in on you before you realize what's happened. And you have to remind yourself that that's not who I am and I don't have to think that thought and I don't have to hold on to that thought. It may be in my head because I've damaged some pathways in there along the way that he will heal up. But it'll, you can get through it. And if you know anybody that's addicted or trying to not be addicted and live their life as a recovering addict, then maybe you could hold their hand. Because sometimes that's all you need somebody to do is just hold your hand. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and, and I just want to say a, um, a special thank you. I've got some of my uh, fellow commissioners here tonight, and I want to say how much I, I really appreciate that. If you guys would stand up, and Mr. Mayor, if you would stand up, and uh, all of our our police officers that are, that are here, and if you all would just kind of stand up, and we've got... Um, some lawyers in the house that's come to be with us and we've got people from different churches we've got a lot of different people here tonight and i just want you to know it it takes a village to do this it takes us all and i appreciate everybody that's put forth the effort of being here tonight and i'm going to turn this over to dr monty burks here and i'm going to tell you this guy no i'm not going to turn it over to him i've done messed up <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to somebody else. I'm nervous right too. Okay. <laughs> All right. But I'm going to let Monty introduce his his friend here, and 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 I'd like for y'all just to be much in prayer for these people. And I and Amy, I appreciate what you did. And and like I said, that was that was a difficult thing for her to do. And I just she's a dear friend for life. Hi, my name is Thomas Hollowell. Um, I work for Fourth Judicial Recovery Court. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Judge Sloan, he, re representing Fourth Judicial Recovery Court. Um, we cover the following counties, Granger County, Cock County, Jefferson County, and Sevier County. We do support the faith-based incentive, the people in our program need more need more options for recovery and support in our communities and that is you all if you have any questions just please let me know that's about it <laughs> uh, so my name is jason goodman i'm project lifeline uh with the state tennessee department of mental health and substance abuse my he, he named a few. I've got 16 counties that I cover for Lifeline. Um, Knox County and 15 surrounding counties, Granger included. I've got a pocket full of cards tonight. Um, Lifeline, there's 10 of us across the state, um, 10 different regions, and we are the hand holders. Um, we, we are the people who, who hold hands and get people access to any kind of recovery service that they may need. If they just need to talk to somebody, um, you'll have my number tonight and they can call me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If they want to go to a meeting, we'll, we'll get them in a meeting. If they want to go to treatment, we'll get them in treatment. If they want to go to sober living, if they want to connect to a faith-based organization, Lifeline will get them plugged in. Um, and this is what we do every single day. So every opportunity I get and get in front of some people that um, th this, as it touches everybody, it harms a lot of people and it causes a lot of separation. Um, so if you'll humor me for a minute, would everybody in here please just stand up for a second? And uh, maybe hug somebody that you've never hugged before. Just give somebody a hug. Yeah. 
So, so thank y'all for hugging somebody. So recovery is, is a contact process. We lose the fear of, of touching and being touched. We hug people. I, I walked up, I just met Candace and she said, I said, hey Candace, I hugged her. She said, did you say Candace? I said, yeah, Candace, you got a name tag on. It says, it says Candace on your shirt. Right there. Um, so this, this is what we know today that if, um, if drugs were the answer, we want to know what the question was. We want to get far enough back to find out what, what was it in your life that had you choosing that to start with. So we begin a process of healing. Uh, you know, Christ gave us that, that example. He's, he went where the healing was. Amen. right? Never avoided that. So that's what we do today. By, by, that, <clears throat> by the experiences we go through every day, we learn that it's about the healing. So Lifeline runs in where the healing is. If you've got somebody that needs any kind of recovery support, they want to start their process or be supported where they are in their process, please get a card from me tonight and call me at any time. And if you've got any questions, I'll be here until, uh, until y'all run me out of here. Okay? So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Monty Burks. Thanks. Thank you. I want my orange. <laughs> Is it working? No. Oh, man. <laughs> you can I got, you can I'm, I'm spirit orange. You can change the thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is working. No, here, you can just drive Oh, you can. Who said people of the church can't have fun? <laughs> <laughs> now y'all tore that one up. Oops. Now I need one of them. <laughs> well. <laughs> well, while they fix it, I'll talk to you for a few minutes. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I did not know this many people were here because I was sitting on the front row with my friend Thomas and I was telling him, Thomas, is, does, this is his first time public speaking tonight. So I said, man, there's not a lot of people here. <laughs> well, just like a good church service, everybody walked in late. <laughs> and we turned around and the pews had filled up. And I said, man, wow, I didn't even notice it. Hey, Leanne, I'll see you back there. But I, I'm thankful to be here tonight. This is the first time I've ever been to Granger County. It's beautiful. I got lost, my phone stopped working, GPS stopped working. Um, I went to the other old Lee Highway, which is just a bunch of houses behind a store on the other side of town. So I got to experience some other parts of, of Granger County, which I, I will tell you, this is God's country. This is beautiful. Uh, my name is Monty Burris. I work with the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. I'm the faith-based director. Uh, they call me Mr. Faith-based or preacher guy, all kinds of other, recovery preacher. I got all kinds of names. Uh, but what I like to tell people is, is that recovery is real, and I'm an example of what recovery means. And I want to tell you all, I'm a man of faith, but I witness my faith through my work. I'm a product of what you can do as a community for somebody who is suffering. March the 3rd, I celebrate 18 years free from my bondage. Now, I'm not going to... I'm not gonna holy dance. I almost holy danced on y'all this morning because y'all's pat. I'll tell you, Derek, Derek had me fired up in just in a few words over here, but I'll tell you a little bit about my story and I'll be brief. Uh, many, many years ago, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, we don't have a lot of kids, but I like to get a laugh. Um, I went to, I'm from Winchester, Tennessee, where Philip Former's from. Philip Former's from my hometown. I'm so glad he's back with the balls. You Kentucky fans, guess what? We got you this year. We got you. We beat, we beat you in basketball twice. Um, but I'm from his town. A small town, and we're on the corner of Jack Daniels and George Dickel. That's what our county backs up to. That was actually the, the places of employment for people in that area. That and working on different kinds of farms. But, you know, believe it or not, I actually didn't drink. I started experimenting with drugs when I was about 12 or 13 years old. Now, anybody who is from a small town, you know that there's not really a lot to do when there's nothing to do. I hung off a few water towers, tipped a few cows, got electrocuted a few times on fences, you know, stuff like that, fun stuff. Fun stuff that kids now don't necessarily make it through like we did. I probably have PTSD from electric barbed wire fences uh, for the rest of my life. I don't even like to see them. But you know, when I was a young man, uh, I, even though I was raised in a wonderful household, my mother, I'll tell you something funny, my father's, my father's Catholic and my mother's Pentecostal. <laughs> Yeah, I'm alive, I made it, I survived. <laughs> but I grew up in a very uh, good, structured, religious household. And I still learned to hide who I was from my parents like so many other people do. We don't tell our parents everything we do. So I started experimenting with drugs as a young man. 
and continued to use drugs my whole high school years. I graduated in the top 5% of my class. I was connected, I played all sports. I was connected with my community. I was on every kind of social club possible, but I still used drugs. I still had an active lifestyle in that community as well as in my social community. In 1994, I left Winchester uh, to, go, to move to the big city to go to college, Murfreesboro. That's what I thought was the big city. Murfreesboro is actually not a big city, but to me it was. So I went to Murfreesboro uh, to study criminal justice at MTSU. Well, my father died my, my two and a half years into college. My father passed away. My father was a military veteran. He was really integral in my life. And I had started to open up with him about the fact that I'd used drugs. And I, you know, I started out uh, trying to ease the conversation with a military man. And if you, don't, you guys don't know, living in a house with a military person can be scary when you want to tell them something you're afraid they don't want to hear. But the problem was he really did want to hear. But I lost him. I lost, he lost a battle due to heart disease. I lost him, 1997. My life spiraled out of control for two and a half years. 1999, I was a full-blown addict. Ecstasy had re-hit the scene. Anybody know what ecstasy is? Ecstasy and ketamine had made a rebound, and now they're on their third rebound. But I started experimenting with club drugs. So just like that, years of my life had gone. I had a child. I lost my home. I lost my family. I was actually homeless. Nobody could see me. You see, I was removed from my structured community, so I found a new community. See, if you don't fellowship with somebody, there's somebody else who will fellowship with them. So I had found me another sense of community, even though that sense of community is not what I needed. So here I was, Mr. Winchester, Tennessee, a full-blown addict, homeless, scared to tell people how to get help. But let me tell you what happened. And this is why I'm the director of the Faith-Based Initiative, because my seeds have been planted since a young man. I had a lady who knew my mother from a jurisdictional choir. They do that in the Pentecostal church. They travel around from county to county and sing with each other. So I saw this lady. She was one of the first ladies at one of the churches that I'd attended. I, really, I didn't recognize her at first, but she confronted me in Shoney's. Do they have Shoney's on this side of Tennessee? Well, Shoney's was a fine eating establishment in my hometown and in the Murfreesboro area uh, with an unlimited salad bar. But uh, she, she approached me and said, young man, I can see that you're hurting. I, I want to talk to you. First, I said, who are you? And she, and she explained, and I was like, oh, you know, I immediately regretted telling the first lady, who are you? You know, you don't do that in the South. It just doesn't go down like that. There's, there's a powerful set of people in a church. The pastor who thinks he's the most powerful, and then the two first ladies or the mothers that are connected to all the families, that's who you get the power from in the pews. <laughs> so she told me, she said, I need you to go to a meeting with me. And me being a macho man from the South, Guys, we're taught not to deal with emotions as Southern men. We're taught to fix it with your tool belt and don't talk about it. That's why we have so many young men that are connected to us that are having the same problems that I had. Because we didn't want to talk about it. We were scared to cry. I'm not saying guys go outside and just start crying on everybody. I, I, that's not what I mean. But what I'm saying is we've been taught, we've been institutionalized to think that you don't deal with emotion. The problem with that is when something breaks, you have to tell somebody, in case you don't know how to fix it yourself. In my case, I didn't know how to fix it. So she said, you're gonna go to a meeting. I said, no, I'm not. She said, yes, you are. So the first lady of a church and a choir member, I went to the meeting. I knew, I knew that I had to go because it was part of the game. Well, she took me to a meeting at a church. It was in the back of a church. It was in an old mop closet, so to speak. It was a 12-step meeting. I had never heard of a 12-step meeting. I had never seen anything like that in my life. I'm telling you this story for a reason. I walked into that meeting scared to death because she said, I'm going to take you to a room full of people that are suffering from the same things that I know you're suffering from. First of all, I said, how do you know what I'm suffering from? She said, because I lost my husband to it. See, her husband came back from Vietnam as a full-blown alcoholic, and the alcoholism took his life. She learned to deal with it, but she was also quiet for too long, and then it was too late for him. So I went into a meeting and saw people who looked like me, who looked like you. I saw overalls, I saw baggy pants. I saw a judge and I saw a police officer who I'd happened, officer who I'd happened to become friends with during my using days because my, my lifestyle was a little sketchy. But they all embraced me and they hugged me and that was the first step. That was the first thing it took for me to actually try to do something else for myself. See, I knew that there was a community of people that were different from what I'd become used to. I needed to go to treatment, but I was terrified because I didn't want to be called those people. But I was those people. I was exactly who the community was meant to affect. I would have never went into treatment if I had never noticed that, known that other people were suffering from the same thing I did. Here we are, 18 years later, just about to the day, 
I'm free from that bondage. But it took those seeds and many more seeds and that process to get me there. Listen, it wasn't easy. I still suffer. I, I, the young lady that just spoke a few minutes ago, I applaud you for your bravery. Where is she at? Hey, girl, thank you. I, I still suffer from some of the long term effects from my drug use. A, couple, a year and a half ago, I had a massive heart attack, right coronary artery, full block, fully blocked. Some of the problems that I had were associated with my drug use in the 90s. But you see, if I had never been introduced to a recovery meeting, which got me into treatment, I wouldn't be standing before you today because the heart attack that I had would have killed me. Now I'm here, and I understand my purpose. So I'm the first faith-based director at our department. I'm a man in recovery. I'm connected to the congregations. I believe that I can show you guys my faith through my works, through the fruit of what I do. And what I do is I'm out there in the community trying to find as many of you as possible to help as many people as possible. This is the 77th congregation that we've been in and done this across this state. 73 counties. There are 73 counties of people that look just like you. We all have a common enemy. Sometimes we go different routes and different streets and different temples and different tabernacles and different denominational terminology but we're still fighting the same enemy. And that enemy has divided our communities. Y'all know good and well, we'll divide ourselves any way we can. Amen. You walk in the lunchroom and kids will divide themselves because of their clothes, by their hair, by their money, whatever. Well, we as adults don't do much different. So what we want to do is connect all of our congregations and say, hey, we're all the same people. Doesn't matter how much money you have or you don't have. Doesn't matter if you have a nice car. Doesn't matter who your mother or father is. Addiction affects three out of four Tennesseans. That means, I didn't say everybody, three out of four people used, but I said they're affected. That means three out of four people in the pews of this sanctuary know somebody or themselves need help. You see, I think it's good, we, at least we can recognize that number, but what then? Well, let's do something about it. Today, just today, Jason's counterparts and himself got 17 people into treatment. Yes. That's a, that's, a, a, that's a minute number of the people that need to get in, but guess what? At least we got 17 people in the treatment. Our faith-based initiative is out building community with people like you. Listen, we don't have to believe the same thing. We don't have to come from the same household to address the same problem. Because just like she said, if you continue to ignore the problem, it doesn't go away. If you continue to think that you can hide the recovery meetings in a back room, you're in, for, you're in for a nasty treat. That's why I like Celebrate Recovery so much because we're putting it right in the front of the pews. So what is addiction? Addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, or related circuitry. In case y'all can't tell, I like to talk. I get fired up a little bit, I'm sorry. Uh, but what that's saying is, is people's systems are re rewired. So a person may, and I use this analogy often, you ask yourself, how can he or she go in a hotel room and leave their children in the car for four hours and get high? Listen, I believe in individual accountability, but we need to understand how the brain has been rewired and why a person functions like they do. They may not realize they've been in the hotel for four hours because their need for water, their need to take care of their children, love, has been overtaken by the disease. There's a reason we call addiction a disease. I'm not here to argue with anyone. If you want to argue about it, we can argue after church, okay? <laughs> Y'all like how I threw that in. I put church on the end so y'all won't try to beat me up. But, <laughs> but addiction is a treatable disease by its definition. You ask yourself, a person, if you know you have hereditary or genetic issues that predispose you to type 2 diabetes and you still have a horrible diet, then you're probably going to get type 2 diabetes. But what do we call diabetes? A disease. When a person suffers from cancer, what do we call cancer? Sometimes cancer can be a product of some of our own choices. But when a person says, hey, I'm suffering from cancer, we bake them a casserole. We go pray with them, we worship with them, we meditate with them, we take them clothes, we do all kind of wonderful things. But let somebody in pew number seven come up and tell you that their child is a full-blown addict. And the first thing we do, even if we don't mean it, the first thing we do is, Psst, told you. Because we've been taught that. You look at law and order and every single person you see that's in recovery or in a meeting, they just broke the law. Even though it's a TV show, we're being programmed to think that addiction looks a certain way. 
and recovery looks a certain way and people in recovery are prone to do so much. Every single person that's broke the law probably hadn't broken it before the first time they broke it. That was really quick, wasn't it? <laughs> but think about what I said. If a person's never had a speeding ticket before and they get pulled over, guess what? They got a speeding ticket, but before then they weren't speeding. See, we have to look at addiction the same way. It doesn't care. You can't take a, that, 26 million Americans are in recovery right now, living in recovery. 26 million. That's a lot of people. They don't all look the same. Make sure everybody understands that. They don't all look the same. I don't look like my past. If I could show you guys what I looked like when I went into treatment, you probably would just, I, I would love to see your eyes roll at me. Y'all better not. So here's some statistics I'd like to share. The number of suicides in Tennessee in 2016 was 1,110, or 16.7 16 per 100,000 people. The number of overdose deaths in 2016, all drug overdoses, was 1,631. And the number of people needing but not receiving for treatment of illicit drug use, alcohol use, and abuse of dependence on other than opioids and heroin, uh, 432,030, 432,000 people. So look at these statistics. There's a reason that I'm sharing these with you. I'm gonna do a correlation here. Tennessee has almost 12,000 institutions of faith across 95 counties. There is no other single demographic that large in the state. You can add it yourself. Anybody here has ever heard me speak, I'm going to give you some numbers and you can get on your phone and add them yourself. Sonic, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, and Taco Bell, you add them up, you get about 2,200 across the whole state. That includes the ones in gas stations, which I don't think are real. Um, <laughs> but that, you get about 22, 2,300, somewhere in that range. But every single person in here can tell me something on the dollar menu at all the places I just named, or at least 80% of them, but you can't tell me what goes on at the faith-based institutions in your county. I'm making a real good point here. Our congregations are strategically and logistically located to beat the epidemic. They're already there. If you can turn your lights on in your congregation, you can have a recovery ministry. If somebody can answer the telephone, even if it's forwarded, you can have a recovery ministry. If one person can answer a, the, the church's main line that's on the front of the billboard and refer that number to Jason, who can refer it to his counterparts, that means you can help somebody in the pews of your church get into treatment or get into a recovery support meeting. Tennessee's population is 6.6 .6 million people. Over half of our state, 3.5 million people are people of faith. You can't deny that number. You can't deny the fact that we have the power in the pews of our sanctuaries to beat the epidemic. But how? How? Well, you know, I don't know about y'all, but I, I come from a town of doers. My town is my state. This is my community. Through Tennessee's faith-based initiative, thousands of people have been saved. Our congregations now pick up the phone because they know how to get people into treatment. Listen, I'm not saying that the, con the church can't handle it. What I'm saying is sometimes we need to send people somewhere else. Sometimes they need to get out of your backyard. Because what happens is if you can't change your playground and playmates, the minute we say that they're clean and they walk out of that front door and you don't walk with them, they got a whole bunch of people standing over on J Street and say, well, you know what, I think he's gonna come back. I got something waiting on you. Over 50% of our state identifies as people who attend congregation services. Guess what that means? We have a captive audience, 3.5 million people. That doesn't mean 3.5 million people are gonna be active, but look at these numbers. There are over 3,173 people of faith per one person who committed suicide. There you go. That's why I shared the numbers. That's, this is where we as a community come in. If you don't step up and stop what's going on, who will? I'm challenging you. You can be mad at me later, but remember we're at church. And they got coffee downstairs. There are over 2,000 people of faith per one person who died of an overdose. I needed one person to get me to go to a meeting. One lady forced me, she forced me because she was the first lady, she forced me to go to a meeting, but guess what? I respected her position. At that particular time in my life, I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I didn't know who God was. I had no sense of spirituality, no sense of faith because I thought that God had forgotten about me. I was at a point in my life that I was face down in the dirt. I didn't believe anything that anybody told me. Matter of fact, I didn't believe in anything. And if, if any of you have not ever had to experience anything like that, be thankful. There are 8.2 people of faith per one person needing but not receiving treatment. If we took a quarter of that and put two people to one person and just walk with them, just like she said, hold somebody's hand. 
Don't hold somebody's hand from a judgmental position, but hold it from one as a person of faith. Listen, we've all fallen short somewhere in life. Amen. And every single person is in recovery from something. I did not say everybody use drugs and alcohol, please. Again, I do not want to fight outside, but I'm being honest with you. Every single person has had a hurt habit or hang up that they had a hard time kicking. I just went straight celebrate recovery on y'all. <laughs> but I'm telling the truth. We're right at home on it. Guys, we have the numbers to stop what's going on in Tennessee. Tennessee has become the national model on faith and recovery. Did you know that? We're going to Washington, D.C. in less than 10 days to present to the country. We'll be in Atlanta, Georgia at the uh, Prescription Opioid and Heroin Summit in April to talk about how the faith community in Tennessee is combating addiction, how we're linking arms, how we're crossing denominational differences and in some instances belief differences to be able to help our kids and our community. Awesome. We're gonna do a webinar uh, for, the, for the world uh, with the uh, Health and Human Services Department in, in late February, so we can talk about how Tennessee's faith community has stepped up to take this challenge. Matter of fact, I, I like to say stepped up to fight. I grew up as a martial artist. I grew up as a combat fighter. I still train. I'm a jiu-jitsu guy. I used to be an MMA fighter. If y'all see some scars or something, when you see me sometime, don't judge me. I haven't been fighting in the streets. It's actually something I was doing it in the gym. But I'm not afraid to fight. I've lost plenty. But I've won plenty, and I know that right now we have the team to do the win or to, or, to, or to be competitive. So what can you do? One, spiritual or pastoral support according to your congregation. This is a basic. This is just a basic uh, uh, best practice model that we use to help some of our congregations in smaller areas. Uh, two, look at addiction as a treatable disease by its definition. We have to move away from the language of moral failing. You can't help somebody if you're calling them names the whole time. I don't, I'm not going to let you help me. Uh, three, embrace and support people in recovery and walk with them on their journey. What did you say? Hold their hands. That's right. Hold their hands. Fellowshipping is the key. Everybody doesn't need to get into treatment. But if we had enough community people that were there to say, hey, look, we got, we got you. We have you right here. Let's go hang out. Let's go hunt. Let's go play kickball. Let's box. Let's go run. Let's climb, let, climb this hill out here in the back. Four, Disseminate recovery information. We can provide that. Five, host or refer individuals to recovery support groups. Uh, Tennessee Project Lifeline is here. We also have, I, I didn't realize that there were so many other groups in this area. I just met a few people tonight. Get people into a meeting. Every congregation doesn't need to have a meeting because you'll water down the recovery community. But what would happen if every congregation got on the same page and had different meetings on different nights? I'm from Franklin County, so I had a, a leg up in the community to work with them on their recovery work. So we have a group of churches who have formed a faith-based recovery coalition. And what they do is they have different meetings on different nights and they use church vans to get people to those meetings. So they have an AA meeting on Monday, NA meeting on Tuesday, celebrate recovery on Wednesday, another meeting on Thursday, and a clothing and feeding ministry on Friday. What happens is every congregation can't have a meeting. They don't have the capacity. But every congregation can put a sign up it says here are the meetings. Every, just about every congregation that I've ever been to has some type of church van. Imagine if we just took people to the meeting at the other congregation. If you have somebody in your congregation that needs to get to a meeting, take them to one. You, respectfully, you're not losing anyone, you're gaining an ambassador. When that person comes back, that's your recovery advocate right there. That's your recovery ministry right there. Uh, number six, become a recovery friendly congregation. Right now we work with 275 congregations across the state and I work with thousands of pastors and what we're doing is helping them understand what the state offers as far as recovery and treatment are concerned uh, helping them support whatever ministry they have listen whatever you do for recovery support in your congregation let me help you whatever you're doing do it keep doing it if it's taking people to work take them to work if it's teaching people a trade teach them a trade if it's hugging people, hug, all of that are forms of recovery support. And look, here's just some different types. Employment services, peer-to-peer -peer services, life skills, relapse prevention. And the main one, this is why we're here, spiritual and pastoral support. Listen, I've been, around the, I've been around the world. I've been to places where people don't believe the same thing we believe. But let me tell you something. When a pastor or a clergy member can walk out in a street in Memphis and make them stop selling drugs for the whole day by himself, and our police officers can't do that, that's a powerful presence right there. And my police officers, I'm a criminal justice professor. I teach at Tennessee State. I design curriculums. I teach evidence and corrections. So I'm connected to the criminal just justice community. 
Uh, and I tell them all the time, I was like, man, I went to Memphis and I was in the projects and they were just in right, in, right, literally right, right in front of everybody just doing whatever they wanted to in the middle of the day. And a pastor walked out and said, hey, I've got my meeting going on. Could you stop? And the whole street cleared out. So we have to take advantage of that power, of that presence, of that leadership. So here are some action steps. One, uh, I would love every, who, who out here represents a different church? How many different pastors do I have here? Okay, that's a great, that, good, good, good. Become a recovery friendly congregation, work with us. Listen, you may be recovery friendly uh, already, uh, but we would love to have you on a list so we could share your information or get you more information. Uh, partner with uh, Project Lifeline and, and myself and, and all of our, uh, all of our recovery uh, advocates around this area to do forums. This is a recovery support forum. This is number 76. Imagine how many people y'all know right now need to be here that are not. It's always somebody that says it's not going to happen to me or it's not in my backyard. Well, they're wrong. It's already in your backyard. For the most part, it's already in your house. And I, respectfully, I'm not, again, that's not, one, that's not something I, I, I'm not trying to start an argument. I'm a man of faith. My master's degree is in criminal justice. My doctorate is in theology. I work with the church. I work with anybody if we can help somebody get clean. Because I know that my way is not going to be everybody's way. I know that your way is not either. But as the more people and the bigger the net, the more people will catch. Every single person you plant a seed with and, and, and show them that, that recovery is real. Every single person in here who has a changed attitude and is not afraid to hug somebody that might smell different, might look different, might be of a different nationality, a different race. Every time you do that, you plant a seed that's gonna save somebody else. I know, guys, we can't save everybody but I believe we can save everybody. I don't, I don't believe in letting anybody fall through the cracks. You know, I, I've got so many uh, statistics and numbers to share, but one thing I want to beat home is I met Pete Hicks. He has Renovatus, the recovery farm that's in Jefferson County. Because I met Pete, I get to tell other people about Pete's story. I work with the faith community, so I've told hundreds of pastors about what Pete does. You know what they want to do? The same thing. They said, well, we got a little bit of land. What if we can start a farm and put people to work that are coming out of jail and prison? 95% of people that go to jail come back right to the same community they left. I, I believe in individual accountability, guys. I was arrested over 20 times. And look at me now. I'm a man in recovery. I'm a professor. I work for the state. I travel around meeting people like you that are ready to go out and they've, they've had enough. My addictions ran deep. Mental health issues ran deep. I still have to deal with the ramifications of my drug use, but because someone planted a seed in me and cared enough to, get, to help me get that second chance, I stand before you today as a man that's clean and a man that's not afraid to go out and help other people. Uh, before I go, I'll, I'll leave you with this real quick. My, my, my path to this job was unique. It was pre-ordered, predestined. I, I, I am a man of faith. Um, my first big job was working at a re-entry program with people in jail and prison. And we had a task to help people find employment that were getting out of prison. Now you guys know, if anybody knows, it's hard to get a job when you have a record. I'm going to tell you why. Let me, take, let me give you one of the reasons why. Because people get out of jail and prison and then you say, hey, go to work. But nobody ever really found out why they went to jail or prison. I mean, on paper, it says they went to prison because they robbed Dollar General. But what we didn't find out is what else, what really happened? What really would send a person into a store to do something like that? And then we started finding out that people had co-occurring substance abuse and mental health issues that they hadn't been diagnosed. And then we started finding out, well, wait a minute. What if we get a support group and, and some treatment opportunities? What can we do? I'm going to tell you what happened. I had a group of guys, 20 guys from 18 different gang affiliations. 20 guys. Nobody wanted to work with them, but I was, I've got a lot of tattoos, so I kind of fit in real good with them. I loved it. It was, it was great. Hey, they had some good tattoos. I have no idea where they got them from. I hope the jail needles are clean because they, they look good. But I have tattoos on my arms. I'm a martial artist. You can look me up online. I've been around for a long time. And I said, hey, I'll take those guys. They were like, well, they're just going to go back to jail. See, that's where you're wrong. Each one of us are God's children. Each one of us deserve a second chance. Now, I, I didn't say that you have to not remember 
what someone done, but I did say if you're a person of faith, we're taught to forgive. Amen. You don't have to forget, but at least understand. So I took those guys and I helped them. I took them into a training program and then helped them get an HVAC certification, some of them electric and some of them plumbing. And almost all of those guys went out and became successful and they haven't went back to jail. That was because we took the time to find out why they went to jail in the first place. And then in the process of getting them ready for work, put them through 12 step programs. That was when CR had just started. The first time a guy went into a CR meeting, he came out and said, well, I didn't know that that's what recovery meant. We got a group of ladies to come into the jail and minister to them. These ladies came in, they were from a red hat society. I don't know exactly what that means, but I just know that that's a powerful group of women that you don't play with. Um, every single one of those ladies were over 70 and they came into our meeting and the guys, I don't know if anybody in here, any, you guys that work in a jail or prison, you know that the language in jail is different than it is in the church. Um, and the guys, are, you know, everybody's tough. I couldn't get them to open up and talk about their emotions. And I, like I said, I like people, you have to open up about your emotions to figure out you got a problem. If you're not, you're going to keep hiding it. So I'll leave you with this. The ladies came in and uh, as soon as they walked in, one of the ladies was humming church song. She was just humming a little bit. I think it, uh, what, uh, his eyes on the sparrow. And she was humming the song and the guy looked at her and he said, I know that song. So the ladies sit down and they talk to the guys. I'm going to tell you something. I was there for days and couldn't get any one of them to get past trying to be tougher than the dude across from them. Those ladies got in there and started just, just, just fellowshipping with those guys and they all started crying. And then I started crying. I had to go out and get some air. I was like, I, just, I can't, I don't want them to see me cry. I had to at least act tough in front of them. Uh, but the ladies, you know, they, 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 they got down with those guys on that level. And then I found out that those guys had never had anybody love them like that and not care. See, those people went to work because somebody took the time to love them and to meet them where they were. And that's where we come in as a faith community. I'm going to stop right there and tell you, thank you for coming out. There are thousands of people like you that are going to have to step up. And that's how we stop. There's no government program that's going to be able to catch every single person in your community. It's not going to happen. If you want your community to heal, you have to heal your community. We have resources. Uh, we have some people that are going to be in panel discuss here next. But we have resources and we have access. All you have to do is reach out. You can call me. I have a card. Uh, you can uh, call myself. Please don't text me too late at night. I'll call you in the morning if you do. Um, I don't mind. And if you get a chance, Make sure you have a chat with Pete about what he does at Renovatus. I said it right, didn't I? You did. Okay. I didn't know how to say it at first when I got the email. I was Renovatus. It's Renovatus. So thank you all for coming out. I appreciate it. All right. I've uh, asked some people throughout our audience if if they would come up, um, they are involved in some of the different agencies and all. So if, if I've spoken to you or if I haven't spoken to you and you represent an agency and would like to share, please come up now. So Wendy and Susan, come on up. And anybody that is representing any type of um, recovery or any group or anything, now is your opportunity to come up. Okay. Anybody else? And please don't don't be bashful. If you're out there and you've got something to say, come up. And this is your opportunity to let people know what that you offer here. So um, I'll turn it over to Corey. <clears throat> hey guys. Um, my name is Corey Leatherman. I'm the founder of Abundant Hope Ministries in Morristown, Tennessee. Um, and I don't know if you guys felt what I felt listening to everyone that was speaking and Amy and the testimony that she gave and Monty and, and the work that Jason does, but there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of hope in our state. There's a lot of hope for people like, uh, for people who, who like I, I am. Um, and see, this is what I want to do. I want to go around to different places and I want to put a different face on addiction. Um, because addiction, when someone says the word addiction, you, you immediately go to what you picture of addiction and most of the time it's not. It's what I used to look like, and if you have time, you can come up. I keep a, a picture of my phone of who I was before I met Christ, and Christ turned my life around. But uh, I had long hair. I had track marks going down my arm. Probably didn't smell the greatest. I was, I don't know, maybe 100 pounds soaking wet. 
I know I look like I ate that guy today, but. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing well. <laughs> but I was broken. And I didn't wake up and say, hey, I'm going to ruin everything I love today. I'm going to turn my back on my family and I'm going uh, for, to forget about all my responsibilities. I'm just going to go and be, and be a drug addict because that's what I want to do in my life. I didn't do that. And I've never met anyone who has. I've been in this uh, work now going on seven years and I've never met anyone to do that. I was, a, I was a good kid, made some bad decisions, found myself in a, in a, in a mess, and I got out because I, uh, someone cared about me, someone got the hope that was out there to me, and that's what you all can do. You may not have all the answers, you don't have to. You may not even know how to, how to start the conversation, but just going beside someone, just holding someone's hand, just getting them to someone who can help them, who can talk to them, that's the first step. I didn't know there was hope. I was planning on dying a drug addict. At best, I could maybe manage it. And I, I, I didn't want to talk about myself, but money got me a little bit worked up. Um, I want to put a different face on addiction. Because I work in it. And, and what you may think and, and the thoughts that may go through your head right now um, about what it is, um, I get to see mothers come to abundant hope and become the mother that God's created them to be and get their babies back. I get to see daughters have new life breathed into them and families getting to spend time with a daughter that's been gone for years. It's not been the same for years. I get to see restoration take place. I get to see people with gifts and callings and anointings and talents step into who they were really meant to be. I get to see the flip side of addiction. And that's what I want to challenge you all to do. Even if you don't have all the answers, even if you don't know where to start, Go find someone's hurting and sit beside them. Let them know there's hope out there, that they don't have to die where they are. That's why I'm so proud of Monty Burks and the work that he does, um, going around traveling to, to different places, because I wish I would have found this hope sooner. Because people will amaze you all the, all the time, right? If you give someone hope and someone a chance and someone something worth fighting for, they'll surprise you. Um, again, my ministry is Abundant Hope. Uh, I'm with Abundant Hope Ministries. We have a 12-month inpatient recovery program for women. If you guys know someone who is struggling with it, we have counselors and we have people on staff that would love to just start that conversation. Um, you can find us online. Um, all of our information is online. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having an open mind and, uh, and fighting back in this addiction. <laughs> Uh, my name's Pete Hicks. I am the uh, co-founder and executive director of Renovatus. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, I, I knew him. Okay, I knew him back when he was that that guy. And, and really, uh, to see his journey and to see how you know Corey's come along, uh, it's just it's been uh, just a real blessing and a joy uh, in in my life. And and to see you know the work that he's doing, you know, it's just incredible. And Another uh, person I, I want to really mention, he left, but is Jason Goodman here, okay? Uh, Jason, uh, he works so hard to help people get help. I mean, this guy is like, I mean, I, I've got his number on speed dial, okay? I mean, it, it's like he, he is, I, I have a list of places you know, I, that I usually give people to call and and now I just tell him to call Jason okay let's just just call Jason because he, he can he can he, I mean he, he does an amazing job and I mean it, it's just uh, miraculous really at, at what all he does so uh, we are a, a Christ-centered uh, recovery community that uh, we take a holistic approach to recovery so uh, I have saw people that would go into recovery and, and they would do you know great work on their recovery and and on their spiritual growth I mean it would be amazing but then they leave the programs and they go back to the community and they go back to the same thing and nothing changes and, and we have this saying nothing changes nothing changes and and so I, I just became a, a burdened, and, and I saw this happening again and again and again. And, and, and my prayer was, I, I was sitting, you know, back there, you know, and my prayer was, you know, God, somebody needs to do something. 
Somebody needs to do something. It's always somebody, okay? And, and, and so one day God made it clear that I was that somebody. And, and so we uh, really uh, started uh, with our home and our farm. So, so we didn't go out and, and lie. I mean, we didn't have a lot, but we started with what we had. Okay, and, and, and that was really uh, made clear to us is, you know, to start where you are and start with what you have. And, and so uh, for the last uh, few years now, God's really had us on a, uh, on a journey. And, and it's been like, man, I don't know what's next. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I, I mean, it's, it just amazes me. You know, God just really, really amazes me. Uh, we look at really four main areas is, is where we really focus on. Uh, our first area uh, that we uh, believe people need a safe home, that, that they need an environment that they're not pressured, you know, to, to use drugs or, or to drink, that, that they need a place that is, uh, it, it's safe, it's a safe space. And, and then we believe that people need community, that, that people are not meant to be alone. And Addiction is a lonely, lonely place. And, and so having people as mentors, as sponsors, as people in our life that, that will, again, take them by the hand you know, and, and lead them along. Uh, we also know that people, a lot of times because of some of our choices and, and uh, we uh, lose out on some of our uh, processes of development. Okay, so, so if, a, if a person starts to use, you know, as a teenager or a young age, then they get stuck. Okay, and, and, and a person, you know, that may be, you know, in their 20s or 30s that, that are getting clean, they're really still, you know, in that age where they started. And, and so a lot of times they didn't develop job skills. Or, or they didn't develop the parenting skills that they need. And, and there's all these, these life skills. How do, you, how do you handle your anger without just, you know, totally, you know, freaking out? And, and so all these things are things that so many times we take for granted. But, but are things that we have to go back and relearn. But the foundation and, and the core of who we are as, as an organization is a Christian discipling ministry. So our foundation is in Christ, and, and everything that we do, everything that we're about, is about Christian discipling. And, and through our Celebrate Recovery program and, and through the, the 12 steps in the community, you know, we, we really walk with people uh, to find their way. And, uh, Monty mentioned it, we, uh, we have a farm. So uh, people that are, are really lacking, maybe in uh, some job skills, well, guess what? You bring them out, you work them on the farm, and I guarantee you, I don't know what their next step is in life, but I guarantee you, it's going to be easier than that farm, okay? And, and, and we have a saying, if they can work with Pete, they can work with anybody, okay? Uh, I'm going I'm to tell you just a, a quick story. Uh, there, there was this uh, young boy, and, and this young boy grew up in a home that had four generations of people. And, and his dad had kind of, he had checked out, okay? He, he was there, but he wasn't there. He, so he was, he was absent. So this young boy, he looked to his grandfather as his primary male role model. Well, his grandfather was a great man. His grandfather worked, and his grandfather provided for that whole household. But his grandfather was a closet drinker. And, and every day, his grandfather would come in, and he would go to his closet, and he would get his whiskey, and he would turn it up. And every day, that little boy would watch his grandfather. And, and finally, the little boy just became just curious at, at what it was that was in that bottle that had his grandfather so captivated. So he started just smelling it. And, and then eventually, he started to touch it to his lips. And by the time he was 12, he was getting drunk. And, and then his parents, just as a last-ditch effort to try to save their marriage, they up and moved to another town. Your problems usually 
uh, go with you, don't they? And, and so nothing really changed there, and his parents wound up getting a divorce. And there he was in another town, away from his family, and, and now alone. And, and one day, there were some guys there, and they came up to him and they said, Do you want to smoke a joint? He didn't know what a joint was. But someone asked him to do something. And, and then he's connected. He's a part of that community. And his drug use escalated. And by the time I was 20, I was addicted. I not only have heard these stories, but I lived these stories. I am this story. I'm, I'm 12 years completely sober this June. And, and at what one time was my, my greatest fear, at one time it, it was you know, the thing that I was the most ashamed of. Now, it's, it's a gift. It's a gift because I know that somewhere out there, somewhere, there's someone that, that made that connection, that understood what that was like. And I just want them to know that there is hope. There is hope. Thank you. Hi, my name is Susan Blair, and I'm representing the Granger County Health Department. Uh, I'm the nursing supervisor at the health department, and we don't offer any direct services for recovery or treatment, but we do have supportive services I'm going to tell you a little bit about, and some education also that we're involved in. Um, a few years back, we started a new program um, for neonatal abstinence education for neonatal abstinence syndrome, and most of you all probably know what that is, but if you you don't. Um, that's what happens when a mom who is pregnant and taking drugs, um, when she delivers, the baby becomes dependent, not addicted, um, but dependent on the drug that the mom is supplying. So when the baby's born and the baby's drug supply stops because the mom's not, um, it's not getting it from the mom anymore, the baby actually goes through withdrawal. So um, it can cause a whole gamut of issues with the baby and lots of problems. Um, so we started going in, actually going into the jail and doing education on neonatal abstinence syndrome with the inmates there. Um, and just letting them know their options if they weren't at a point in their life or if they, they absolutely knew they weren't ready to um, have a baby at that time. Uh, we went over their um, reproductive life plan options and um, we could actually transport them to the health department and, and go ahead and start family planning services for them, long-term methods um, to, so that they wouldn't have to worry about that until they could get to a place in their life where um, they were ready to have children. Judge Sloan was really instrumental in bringing that program about. It's not just our county, but all the surrounding counties. More recently, we started actually doing that um, with people who are released on probation. So we do that education for um, men and women. Judge Sloan makes that a condition of their probation, so they come to our office and um, go through that education. It may not particularly apply to them, but hopefully they'll share that with a family member or a friend if you know if they have anybody that um, that would pertain to. Um, also, um, the lifestyle um, that that people are in if they're using puts them at risk for several different diseases like HIV and hepatitis B and C. We also offer um, testing for, for hepatitis C, just recently started doing that and HIV. Um, in an effort to link them to um, treatment. If they come back positive and they're at a point in their life where they're ready for treatment for hepatitis C, we can get them linked to care. Um, and we also provide immunizations. Of course, everybody associates health department with shots, and we do that um, just because if, if they are at risk, they need to be vaccinated. So we also provide those. My name is Wendy, and I am a member here at First Baptist Church, Bean Station. I am with Celebrate Recovery here in Bean Station. We started about a year ago working on ourselves because to do Celebrate Recovery, you've got to get yourself out of the way, your own hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And I had thought I did that 20 years ago when I 
got all my past. You know, we've all got a past. We've all got a story. And I, you look at these men and, and women and, you know, people are always 